Hello, and welcome to Why Do We Do That, a psychology podcast that deconstructs human behavior from the perspectives of social scientists, psychologists, and others that use applied psychology in their work. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Moyer. In this episode, I sat down with Kelly Carlin, the daughter of legendary comedian George Carlin. Kelly started her professional career working behind the scenes with her parents on various shows for HBO. After her mother's death in 1997, she found her true calling, autobiographical storytelling, and wrote and performed her one-woman show, Driven to Distraction. In 2015, Kelly released her highly acclaimed memoir entitled A Carlin Home Companion, Growing Up with George. Most recently, Kelly felt a calling outside of the entertainment industry and earned a master's degree in Jungian depth psychology, choosing to focus on various public speaking topics targeted at helping others live an authentic life and discover happiness using her personal stories about addiction, anxiety, losing both of her parents, and growing up in the shadow of fame. Kelly and I had an enlightening discussion on self-expression, and creativity. Listening to Kelly's words made me realize that those of us at the beginning of a creative journey can avoid numerous mistakes early on simply by listening to the stories of those that have walked the path successfully before us. We discussed the many forms of negative self-talk that stifle self-expression and ways to overcome these barriers. One thing I noticed after our discussion was the importance of your environment and how the wrong environment can make creative expression an almost impossible task. There are conditions that must be met in order for creativity to flourish, much like how plants cannot grow without water and sunlight. While personal struggles may provide the seeds for creative expression, People need to experience feelings of safety and stability at some point in their lives in order to mine useful insights out of these seeds. Kelly's personal experiences have provided her with incredible perspective on the topic of authentic self-expression. I hope that her stories are as inspiring to you as they were to me. Enjoy. All right, I'm joined today by... The one and only Kelly Carlin. Thank you so much for being on today. My pleasure to be here. I'm excited about the potential of our conversation. Yes, uh, I am excited as well. This is a a very exciting day for me. Um, So uh, most of the listeners uh, at this point probably know that uh, that you are the the only child of George Carlin, uh, one of the, if not the greatest stand-up comedians of all time. And um, and and while you've worked in entertainment and writing to for a large part of your career, um, a lot of people may not know that you have had some formal training in psychology. Like you have a master's degree in psychology, and you're heavily involved with coaching and and sort of speaking engagements. And um and one of the topics that that uh, interests me in particular that. Uh, is one of your areas of focus is self-expression, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So why don't we start uh, with uh, you giving just a a, uh, a description of why self-expression in particular is one of your passions? Well, I think the main reason it's a passion is because it's the thing that was the hardest for me always. <laughs> It's about self-healing. It's about self-help in the end. And uh, it it seems my whole life, I always had an issue with or difficulty in speaking what I was feeling or speaking what I was thinking. Um, uh, growing up in a lot of chaos and a home where there was some addiction, a lot of addiction, uh, being an only child, kind of creating the whole codependent thing going on there. And so on some level, that was really hard for me to kind of talk about what was going on inside of me and speaking it out loud, because um, for those of us, uh, the majority of humans (laughs) (laughs) who grew up in some chaotic kind of childhood home, uh, you know, 
my job was not to rock the boat. My job was to be the caretaker. My job was to be the, um, the diplomat, always trying to broker the peace in the house. And so biting my tongue was kind of part of my natural inclination. Although, you know, on the other side of that, you know, there was also a lot of creative personal expression going on as a kid, as kids do, Mm -hmm. you know, we are always making things and doing things. And I was always, you know, in, you know, my kind of my 10, 11, 12 years, you know, those years where you're like, you know, doing skits and that kind of stuff, you know, so there was a lot of that going on too. Uh, But growing up in the shadow of someone who was really good at self-expression, at least public Mm -hmm. self-expression, there was a huge shadow there for me around public self-expression. And so that really, I always felt stifled, terrified to really do my work, show my work, be out in the world. Um, All the stuff that kind of comes with being the child of a dot, 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 Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the perfectionism, you know, that's really what it's been about, I think, is, is the perfectionism that comes with that. So my obsession with it is really, you know, about heal, heal, you know, physician heal thyself kind of a thing. And then when you start to learn a little bit about how you, t- how you work and, and what makes you tick and how to move out of your own way, I'm very much a person who likes to share what I've discovered. Mm-hmm. So that therefore then the, the coaching and the, the talking out loud about it in the world. <laughs> <laughs> now the, so that that's interesting that you say that uh, that interpersonally in in your family life, you were stifled in terms of self-expression, but you also found creative outlets. Now, I'm curious, you, you got my wheels turning now. Um, I'm curious if you think that this, this, old, this stereotype that performers or comedians had a troubled home life, right? Is, do you think that when your home life interpersonally you have trouble expressing yourself like to your parents that that is commonly leads to creative outlets so that that create creativity is kind of spawned out of not getting enough attention from your parents i don't know i mean i really feel like i wasn't able to really start to step into owning my creative expression. I mean, I always feel like I've kind of been inching along with it. I mean, my twenties were a shit show. I was married to an older man and doing way too many chemicals and finally got my shit together at 25. And um, so, you know, since 25 and I'm turning 60 this year. So, you know, crazy amount of time. It's been an inch by inch by inch kind of claiming of territory for myself. Um, I don't know how other, I've never been, I mean, it took my dad, both my mother and my dad to die for me to fully step into my full self-expression. So I think that says a lot about how the interpersonal dynamic of family really limited me uh, to feel free to be fully self-expressed in a public way. Um, but I think it's very partic- particular to my life. Um, other performers, other, I mean, I didn't step into performing or kind of being a, a public expressor as a performer until after my mom died. So it was like my mid thirties when I started inching in that world and it was very limited and very small. Um, and so, uh, you know, but I, I, I don't think there's any kind of blanket thing you can say about explaining what makes a performer an artist I mean I think I think if you're introverted and sensitive is what makes you an artist you know because you Mm -hmm. kind of see and feel things and look at the world through different eyes and then have a have a desire to express that through some medium Um, but for me I've always seen the two things very connected that you know between the family life and needing to be the caretaker and the diplomat within the family. And then the huge shadow that my dad created publicly for me, um, you know, both of those things really weighed heavily on my ability to feel safe and free to 
to be a, a public expressor of ideas yeah. and 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 creativity. So n- now looking back, right, you're you, you're spending a lot of time um, sort of uh, helping others. Like you, you're spending a lot of time helping others sort of uh, speak their truth and to come into their uh, feel feel more comfortable in their skin, things like that. Uh, yeah. Looking looking back is uh, do you do you recall any specific transitional moments where you started to or you started to get it where you started to have insights and you know was this was this in a, a therapeutic ses- session was it just reading about something that sort of clicked you know were, were was there sort of a threshold or a tipping point when you started to um, put some things together um, I think it's, like I said, I really do think it's incremental, but certainly therapy helped with that. Um, what I like to call that kind of path that I help people with and the path that I, I feel like I've been on is really having authentic agency. Mm-hmm. So feeling a sense of agency in the world, but really aligned with your authentic, authentic, true self, whatever that is. We, you know, there's so many vague words to call that, but you kind of know it when you feel it kind of Mm -hmm. a thing Mm -hmm. um and I think when my mom died I was 34 35 and um that was a huge wake-up call for me a huge huge transformational moment and I write about this in my memoir um that you know it I thought I would fall apart when my mother died um because I'd been worried about her dying my entire life being that she was a pretty severe alcoholic until I was 12 years old. And then she had breast cancer and a bunch of other autoimmune stuff. Um, And then it finally happened. And this incredible sense of self and calm came over me. um, Wow. Which really shocked me. And there was a groundedness, even though I was deep in grief for two years, I mean, just torn asunder by it, like as if a limb had been ripped off of my body, that kind of amount of thematic pain in in the grieving process but at the same time a clarity came about oh death is real um you know there is a limited amount of time and um I'm 35 and I've kind of been um bobbing around my life and not quite finding my feet and it's you know, a little bit of shit or get off the pot time for me. And I, and it's really when I first stepped into my creative life and started doing some creative online comedy stuff back when the internet, when the comp, when, when, (laughs) when you could see video on the internet and it was like a one by one square, you know, it was like this, it was crazy, but I found this company that was interested in me and let me make little short films and actually paid me for it. So I wrote and directed it and starred in these things. And it was kind of like, early daily show kind of packagey kind of things that I did. And um, that was kind of my dream. And, um, and then I ended up writing a solo show that I wanted to talk about called driven to driven from driven to distraction about why I could never find my authentic self. And so part of that was my parents, you know, being the diplomat for my parents, uh, doing my own crazy drug addiction in my teens, marrying an older man in my twenties and kind of always looking outside of myself for the answers instead of finding my own home and how my mom's death really woke me up to it. And um, so, you know, my mom's death was a, was a big thing. And then, um, and then going to Pacifica and getting my master's in Jungian counseling psychology and really having a, uh, a safe space to explore the depths of my personal narrative. And you have to do a lot of work on yourself when you're studying counseling psychology because Mm -hmm. you have to self-manage a lot. So you have to really work your own complexes and your own stuff. And and the school I went to is more from an analytical framework, you know, Jungian, Freudian, unconscious, all that stuff. That's why they call it depth psychology. Um, So that gave me a different kind of a way to feel more aligned and authentic and away from the entertainment business, like a whole nother world where parts of me could come out that didn't need to fit into the mold of the entertainment industry. Like I'm not going to perform or I'm not going to 
be a writer or I don't have to like move up some sort of ladder in the system there that this was a this was expression uh out of a deep kind of mythopoetic pure space uh you know this is a place where Pacific is a place where Joseph Campbell's archives are so mythology is really taught there and lived into and, and personal narrative and collective narratives and all that kind of stuff so I was given like a big like if you you know you can imagine it like a big mother's womb like the safest space ever to explore and express from that space and coming out of that that really helped me then as I moved forward with my creative expression and started writing stories more and doing small personal essays around LA and small kind of salons and rooms and stuff like that, I started then learning my craft and honing my craft of writing for the stage and doing these readings and learning how to stay in my body while I'm there and taking the audience on a ride yeah. and really learning that dynamic, you know? So it's, it's, you know, these kind of big, big way stations in my life. And then of course, then my dad died and then a whole nother fucking world opened up for me. So, right. um, but you know, I, I feel that when we let ourselves be pulled forward by life and not pushed or not should, you know, or, you know, all of that kind of, when we're not living out kind of the false narrative of who we think we're supposed to be, but let ourselves be pulled by who we who we have a kind of a an inkling of who we're you know who we want to be or who we're here to be. Um, I think when we follow those kind of crumbs on the trail, we get led to deeper and wider ways and places of uh, ex uh, permission to express ourselves in different ways. Yeah, I, I hopefully. I'm creating a, a creative, uh, safe space for my students. Uh, we talk a lot about <clears throat> creativity and uh, sort of starting from the position of, of why are you doing this, right? You have to start from the core motivation. And, you know, I have students that are studying game design. And so it's like, well, why are you studying game design? What game do you want to make? Because if you if you put anything else first, you put, you know, what your parents want or what is lucrative, like that's when you start. It's just the it's the it's the bad first step when it comes to an artistic venture. Um, yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about how to strike a balance between a creative vision and the audience it's intended for? Because. I mean, I, with the exception, of, I'll just take the, this podcast, for example, right? I, I struggle with, with how to make decisions that are, that are consistent with what I want to achieve, because at, at the end of the day, there is an audience, right? All, you know, all artistic ventures have audiences and you kind of have to make some sacrifices at some point. Could you just talk a little bit about, about creativity and, what considerations kind of pop up when you're navigating these waters? Yeah. And I, I like where you started with, which is, I think you have to start from just the pure urge to express with no boundaries, no product, no audience at the beginning. You, you have to honor the thing that's moving through you, whether, whether it's the metaphor or the visual thing you see um, or the experience, the energy you're trying to create, like whatever medium it is, there's something that's tapped you on the shoulder and, you know, uh, has to come through you in some way. And at first you have to just honor that urge and you can't, you can't, you can't put any, anything on it at the beginning, because the minute you do that, like you said, if you think about, well, how am I going to make money on this? Or what are my parents going to think? Or yeah. what is the audience going to think? Yeah. Um, now you're in a different part of the creative process. And the creative process has a lot of different steps to it. Yeah. But starting um, and honoring the start and honoring the thing that's pulling you towards whatever it is, writing, painting, game design, coding, whatever it is, right? 
So there's that piece and giving yourself permission. Like so much of what I do is helping people just get that they get to do that part. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, you actually get to do that part. Um, and and it, then- it's also surprisingly, you know, it, it almost seems easy to, uh, to, to, to sort of find out what you like, what is your passion, but it's, it can actually be pretty challenging to dial in what you want to achieve because, right. You know, it's, it's primitive, but we, if you don't have a language to express it, you know, you you know, maybe you have like, you know, you want to summarize your family life in, in an artistic piece. It's like, yeah, but what's the story there, right? You have the emotions, but but there's still that process of putting it together, which is, you know, it, it's just funny to me that that you would think that the passion part would be easy, but it can actually be challenging. Yeah, and, and you know, and the thing is about creativity is you're you're using an, you know, and I know that the science they don't talk about it this way, and it's it's much more nuanced than this, but you really are using right brain, left brain over and over again. You're moving from both sides of ways of making sense of the world. And so inner, outer, um, abstract, somatic, uh, you know, thinking, feeling, right? There's all these different modalities you're working through. And the artist goes back and forth between these two things. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning, so the beginning, sometimes you can have an idea like, oh, I want to write a book. But, you know, if you're only writing it from the idea of I want to write a book, you're, what are you going to fill it with, you know? And so there's, there's this venturing that we need to be able to go into and, and transition between these two ways of seeing, processing, thinking. And, you know, and at the beginning, and, you know, because I, I work with Jungian, ima- deep imaginational kind of practices and active imagination and think, you know, getting people to move past the ego mind to past the left brain thinking and into a semi-trance hypnotic state, which is a flow state. Lots of books have been written about this. You know, lots of things, lots of universities teach this stuff uh, to get more into the flow state part of the brain where, you know, things will just, you know, your unconscious has the book written already. Trust me, it's all in there somewhere. It's about you translating and moving it into the actual manifest of the painting or the book or the words or whatever it is. And so you have to have be able to freely move in these two territories. And I think most people, um, you know, are are afraid to move over um, for fear of getting lost or not knowing what to do with that or for fear of emotions that might come up and all, you know, it's where kind of, it's where our unconscious is. It's where our shadow stuff is. It's, you know, it's not, it's not taught in our culture to do this. We don't have ritual what we used to with churches because churches create that you studied the uh, magical thinking and stuff. You know what I'm talking about. There's a part of us that's wired for this, right? So let's use it in a healthy way. So even ritualizing your creative process can be important. Lighting a candle, um, having a certain space where you do it in so that you can activate this flow state more, Mm -hmm. which then once you do some flow state stuff, then you kind of step out of that reverie and then you're like, oh, look, these I'm just, all these paintings have something blue and green in them. How interesting. Maybe I'm mm-hmm. doing something with that. And then the other part of your brain's like, yes, let's go that way. You know, so it's a, it's a constant dialogue. And I think really so much of this is about trusting that you know more about your process, that your whole psyche knows everything it needs to know about this process and what you don't know, whether it's editing or shaping or audience or how to move it out into the marketplace. Like that's all stuff that humans can teach you. So we know the, the what here we've kind of established that you need to kind of go inward and, 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 and remove any sort of barriers to uh, what comes up, right? You want to remove all those constraints to kind of find your true self. Uh, I'm curious as to, what is the how for finding what your true message is? And what, what I mean is practically speaking, if you were to, uh, you know, consult with consult with somebody who's like, you know, I have all these experiences and these are the emotions. 
like what what would you practically say uh to them to um to better mold and 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 find that true message well i think it you you have to be a pattern seeker you know what do you keep returning to mm-hmm. what are the books on your shelf you know you go look yeah. at my library in my uh, my studio in my office you can see what i'm into i'm into self discovery uh, you yeah. know i've got a couple of philosophical things but i've got a lot of zen buddhism i've got some uh you know a lot of writing and creativity stuff mythology all of the jungian stuff have some of the new age stuff, have a lot of kind of practical leadership stuff, um, have some science kind of stuff too. Um, you see, you see what my pattern is, you know, so really helping people to see, you know, what, what do you pursue for a little while and then maybe give up on, but then comes knocking on the door a year later, two years later, five years later, a lot of the people I work with are over 40, over 45 years old. You know, what did you, what were you fascinated with as a teenager or in college or in your twenties, but then gave up for the career or for the traditional route? Um, You know, what, what, what visits you all the time? So pattern seeking is really important. Uh, And and I think it it becomes obvious. And my brain goes to what are you, what are you curious about? Right. Yes, if, perfect. If, Great you, question. if you had an hour to research anything you wanted, what would yeah. you choose? Right. And another question, you know, uh, uh, in coaching, we use a lot is, you know, well, what do you spend money on? What do you spend your time on? Mm. Um, what do you, what makes you mad? What, what pisses you off about the world? What's not getting enough attention? Do you think, um, you know, because that, that's your values. Those things are all value driven. So when you start to tap into what people uh, really um, see as meaningful, um, then you can help them connect the dots also with that. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if people have, uh, you know, well, I, you know, I donate to all these causes and I'm on Twitter and I'm retweeting and it's like, well, it sounds like justice is an important value for you. You know, how might you live into that in a way beyond being the typical citizen justice person right now, Mm -hmm. which is click, 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 click. But, you know, what's what is it you want to tell the world? What do you think? the What's the conversation the world is missing? Um, You know, oh, well, people should just be gardening. Oh, okay. well, tell me more about that. You know, Mm -hmm. so then gardening becomes this thing, you know, like, well, well, maybe that's what it's about for you is spreading passion of that you know? Yeah. So yeah. there's lots of ways in to find people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I also, I also encourage people, it, it's almost counterintuitive, but I encourage people to, uh, to aggressively try new things. Cause yes. you, you might think that the key to understanding your passion is going inward but that's kind of that kind of assumes that you already know it. Maybe you don't already yeah. know your passion, right? And so, like, uh, you know, if you get into the habit of saying yes to all these new things, uh, you know, not everything's going to hit. <laughs> it's just not. Yep. It's like it's not going to interest you. But if you get into the process of investigating new activities, not if you don't like it, don't quit right away. Wait till you've gotten a grasp of that activity before you quit right you can still yeah. quit but but the, you know these these exploring brand spanking new things that you wouldn't normally do also seems to be a gateway to to finding these paths well it's uh, very few people uh grow up knowing who they want to be and what they want to do in the world very few people i mean I, decades and decades i floundered around looking for my thing and you do, you have to be able to, you have to step into things and step into action to really understand anything, you know, intellectually understanding something is going to get you not very far. Um, but having an experience uh, and doing, in, and I love that, you know, like doing things way outside of your comfort zone or way outside of your normal patterns or things like that. Uh you'll know, you'll know, um, you'll know either the activity itself is really jazzing to you, or maybe it'll be like, oh, I took a pottery class. I don't really like pottery, 
but I loved being in a community with people yeah. learning something. It's like, Oh, okay, well let's, so, you know, being in a community is important, you know, like getting that kind of information is important. Um, you know, Oh, I realized I don't really like working with my hands. You know, I'm not that good at it, you know, but I really do love working with ideas. Okay, great. You know, so it is, it's so true. I really encourage, you know, being in the doing is, is it just, so essential in coaching and you know i'll have a lot of clients who um you know want to kind of just ponder things and it's like look i pondered my life for a long time but it wasn't mm. until i started doing something that i realized a if i'm not perfect at it i'm not gonna die and it doesn't mean it's not my path um but it means that i get to learn a new skill or a new craft and i get to see like the process of becoming also there's something about that. Like for those of us who are perfectionistic, we'd rather stay in our house and think about our paths than actually do something and possibly yeah. fail at it. But every time I've failed at something, I have learned more than any other time in my life. Uh, and, and usually it's like, Oh, I don't know how to do this yet, but I really want to learn how to do it. Right. Uh, uh, which means, Oh, maybe this is my path because I'm not willing to give up just because I don't know what I'm doing yet. So, uh, so speaking of, of finding yourself and kind of finding your true self, um, let's talk about your father, George, for a moment. I, I think that most people may not be aware that, that he started off it, with doing a certain type of comedy that changed very drastically in the early seventies. Um, could you talk a little bit about, uh, about, you know, your view of his shift into a more counter cult from, from a more mainstream comedic role to a more counterculture? Uh, you know, what, what, what is, what are your insights into what you think was happening for him in internally when he was going through this shift? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll just, use what he talked about with it i was a kid at the time but um i mean of course uh if, if you're if your audience is really interested i highly recommend the documentary that we just did called georgia carlin's american dream which really walks you through the, all this stuff in a really great way but um you know my father was born in the late 30s uh he was a kid of the, 50, the 40s and the 50s uh you know came of age as a teenager in the 50s uh, and then, you know, started performing in 1960. Uh, there was no counterculture in 1960. There was jazz and there was beatniks and things like that. And my dad was internally was a counterculture person his entire life. But externally, if he wanted to do be a performer and be a stand up, he had to play the game. And there was it was a very, very, very narrow road. And uh, it was suit and tie and dinner clubs and trying to get a spot on TV. And TV was everything for you. If you could get on TV, then you could, when your name came up in the local paper at the local dinner club, you know, more people would show up. And, uh, you know, that's, that's how you built a career in the 60s. So TV was everything. And in order to go on TV, you had to look the part, which was short hair and uh, suit and tie. All right. And so he, uh, so he played that game, you know, part of his dream was to be, he had this kind of three part dream when he was a kid. Uh, he wanted to be Danny Kay. He loved Danny Kay and all of his verbal gymnastics. My dad, very much a verbal gymnastic person. Uh, then he thought, well, if, if I, then I become to Danny Kay, then I can, um, well, he wanted to start in radio. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Go back up. <laughs> totally right. screwed that up. Uh, so he started. He wanted to start in radio. He thought, I'm going to start as a DJ. Uh, and then once I get a good enough following as a DJ, then I can go and be a, a comic on a stage. And then from that, I'll grow into becoming Danny Kay and being a movie star. And so he did exactly that. He went into the Air Force at a young age, uh, underage, and um, became a DJ right away. They let him go DJ in his local town where they were doing their Air Force training. Uh, and then he immediately after that uh, started doing stand up with the, he had a partner at the time, Jack Burns. 
and then Jack and he broke up and then he did a so he was a solo a comedian um he never quite made it to the danny k thing he did he was in lots of movies did some acting but he really acting was difficult for him it was different it wasn't really the dream um and then you know there's the rest of his story but what happened to my dad was that he was that counterculture person on the inside and so as the 60s kept cooking on and the war in vietnam started heating up and then all the protests and then the you know the the, the revolution basically of you know, sexual revolution and counterculture revolution and all of that, you know, those, those were my dad's people. That's who he was hanging out with. He was hanging out with musicians always. It was always his crowd, always his people. And he was entertaining the parents of these people. And he was a little older than the counterculture kids and a little younger than the parents. He was kind of right in the middle and he was dying inside. He felt like he was dying inside. And so he started sabotaging things and, walking on edges around these more um, uh, clean cut types of gigs. And he got fired in Vegas for saying the word shit on stage, which mm -hmm. was ridiculous. And, um, and he went to my mom in 1970 and just was like, you know, or 69 and said, and plus he dropped a bunch of acid too, <laughs> <laughs> um, which really, as he said, it's a mind changing drug. You know, it's one of those drugs that shifts your perception and you see the world differently. And he saw the world differently and his own life differently. And he went to my mom and said, I can't do this anymore. This is, I'd rather not do anything than do what I've been doing. I'd really like to try this other path and just be myself on stage and let, let my insides out. Mm -hmm. And then his, his, you know, he was very successful as a, as a straight comic, but he was very bored and everyone wanted him to do the same thing over and over again. And then within two years, he had three albums come out, um, FMAM, Class Clown, and Occupation Fool. And they all went, you know, gold albums, platinum albums, and he became a superstar from that. So I distinctly remember um, in the in the documentary American Dream that you had mentioned that uh, your dad was happier in his 60s. Uh, compared to uh, other other points in his life. Uh, what what do you attribute that to? Um, well, I think that was partly a personal thing. Uh, my my dad turned 60 when my mom died and they were still married and still together when my mom died. Uh, and I think part of what happened was about a year after that, he met someone new and someone younger, a woman named Sally Wade. And um, he kind of became like a teenager again. Like he was in that young love kind of state. Uh, and so that part of it was that, you know, my parents loved each other, but I don't think at the end they were in love with each other. And they had a ton mm -hmm. of baggage through all the drug and alcohol years and all of that. And they, and they were soulmates, you know, and they'd had an incredible ride together. But, you know, my dad became like this born, you know, as a lot of happens with a lot of men that age, you know, they can't be alone. They have to be in relationship. And, uh, you know, so that so part of it was that I think was just his relationship with Sally and this kind of this freedom in that and that him getting to be feeling 20 something again, I think, in, in a lot of ways. Um uh, but he also had a lot of medical issues in his 60s. He was in heart failure the last five years of his life, and that was really tough for him. Um, but as an artist, you know, like when he turned, um, you know, 50, like the late 80s is really when it started, he really found his voice as an artist. And um, the, uh, the, the HBO special that came out in 92, and I'm completely spacing on the name of it right now, um, which had like the planet is fine and routines like that. He really said, you know, that he had found his art true artistic voice at that age and, um, and really, you know, really, really found a stance as an artist to, and, you know, and that's all the stuff you see now on Twitter and all the social media, like all the, whenever my dad's trending, it's because, you know, something that he did probably the last 30 years. And because that's really when he spoke truth to power in such a powerful way and did it with great panache and great playfulness. 
and also, but, you know, big truth bomb telling um, while making us laugh at our own idiocy um, and, and really um, speaking about the very things we're living through now, 30 years ago, which we all laughed about and would go, oh God, that's true. Ha 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 ha. You know, um, he was onto something. He really, really got the ignorance of, of the American psyche and that we were all, as he used to say, you know, the reason we called the documentary the George Carlin's American Dream is because he would say, you know, you have to be asleep to believe in it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, he was at the top of his game his last 25 years. All right. Well, on that note, uh, I, I highly recommend uh, American Dream. It's on HBO Max. Uh, it is a it is a fantastic journey through uh, George Carlin's life. And Kelly makes uh, multiple appearances and and was um, a, a part of that project. Um, definitely check it out. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kelly, for being on today. I really enjoyed talking about self-expression, and uh, it, it really, it really is an honor to uh, to have this conversation. So I'm very grateful uh, that you agreed to uh, to do this. Well, thank you for having me, Ryan, and uh, uh, always a pleasure. For more on Kelly, visit humansontheverge.com or follow her on Twitter at Kelly underscore Carlin. Be sure to follow the Why Do We Do That Facebook page for updates and additional content. Don't forget to rate and write a review on Apple Podcasts. If you enjoy this podcast, please share an episode with two of your friends. Follow the Why Do We Do That Facebook page for updates and additional content. Don't forget to rate and write a review on Apple Podcasts. Follow on Instagram at Why Do We Do That Podcast or Twitter at WDWDTPod. As always, feel free to email me with comments or guest suggestions at Why Do We Do That Podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Dr. Ryan Moyer, hoping you found some answers to the question Why Do We Do That? Mm-hmm.